welcome everybody who is attending live this session and this is just for the just for you just to help you uh focus and prepare for uh, the sbr exam next week um i'm happy to take your questions i'm happy to run through a presentation to try and give you uh, an extra incentive and, and and some some input and before I get to the end and, and deal with the general questions at the end, um, there are three very specific questions I always get asked at this time. What to do now? What to do in the exam? Um, and will I pass? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I want to tell you about a couple of topics. So there'll be a little bit of technical content here. I want to get you to be the marker. And I'll talk to you about what I think is coming up in the exam. So we'll save that to the end. Save that to the end. Okay. And then there'll be your, your general questions. So that's the basic structure of the process. I'm not going to bother to introduce myself. I'm just going to get, you know, straight into the process. Do you know who that man is? Does anybody, it's, it's four pictures of the same person. He is my favorite pop star. Anybody? Nobody's my age, are they? He wrote Town Called Malice, Going Underground. No, nobody. Absolutely nobody. Hey, Oliver. Yes, he's the lead singer of the jam. He is Paul Weller. Now, I'm going to go and see him in a couple of months. And when I see him, I don't really want him to say, oh, here's a load of songs from the new album. I want his greatest hits i want to have a familiar experience i hope tonight it's largely going to be a familiar experience i hope i'm not going to say anything radically shocking or radically new we're a week out away from the exam i'm giving you reassurance i'm giving you some extra tips yeah, hopefully I'm not going to turn your world upside down. If you're a week away from the exam, I'm assuming you've covered the syllabus. If you're a week away from the exam, I'm assuming you started to do mocks. And therefore, because it's close, yeah, because it's real, all right? You should be doing questions to time. There's a very simple answer as to what you should be doing between now and the exam. And that is questions to time. There's two limiting factors there to prevent you passing the exam. One is knowledge. Yeah, one is knowledge. So if you had five, six, seven hours to do the exam, you'd still fail if you didn't have enough knowledge. But the vast majority of students don't suffer from a lack of knowledge to pass the exam. No one's perfect. You don't have a, you don't have 100 percent knowledge. The issue when I'm marking scripts and marking scripts and marking scripts is there's gaps. There's 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 not enough written down. There's only three questions being answered. Time pressure is enormous in the exam. And that's what you've got to get used to. You are not trying to create the examiner's answer. You're trying to earn one mark at a time. And so doing questions to time is essential. And you can see me do questions to time. Yeah, on my YouTube account. All right, if you haven't found my YouTube account, find my YouTube account. If you haven't found my podcasts, find my podcasts. But the principal thing you should be doing between now and the exam is question practice to time, mock exams to time. And please, please, on the ACCA practice platform, if you can. Yeah, don't be handwriting out answers. Because you're not going to be handwriting in the exam. Don't be reading a book and typing on Word because that's not what's going to happen in the exam. Ideally, you're on the ACCA's practice platform and you are pounding away, 
getting used to the clunky, clunky format and the clunky way that they open things up and close things down. This weekend, you go for burn. This weekend, yeah, you work flat out. But the exam's on Thursday. So by Tuesday night, Wednesday night, you need to be doing this. Yeah, a bit of yoga. <laughs> bit of warming down. Muhammad Ali did not have a heavy training session the night before a big fight. Usain Bolt would have a shower, have a have a massage the night before a big race. He wouldn't have a heavy training session. You've got to go into that exam fresh. You've got to go into that, that exam confident. And that means you are revising your revision this week. And on Wednesday night, having an early night. Yeah, taking it easy, warming it down, because I don't want you burnt out. Taking exams is exhausting. It's exhausting, right? And you mustn't burn out because if you burn out, you, you, you're not performing at your best. You're not performing at your best. Okay, so let me just pause here for a second. What should you be doing between now and the exam is getting faster is much more important than, than um, getting more knowledge. You're a fighter, so you've, you've no, there's no real thing to be gained by gaining more muscles. You've got to be smarter in applying it, okay? I hope that's not a radical surprise to you. What did you do in the exam? Oh, my God, there's so much I could say. Answer the question. Read the question. Da -da 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 -da. Get off to a fast start. You've only got three hours and 15 minutes to do this exam. You do not want to read question one, then question two, then question three, then question four. Do not start by reading the question. Go into the exam with a preconceived idea as to which question you want to do first. Which question do you want to do first? Do you want to give me a number in the chat box? Which question do you think you're going to go into the exam to do for? Some are saying question one. Some are saying question two. Yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a it's a it's a personal decision to make. I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer. I think the criteria for making the decision is that you do something that you're comfortable with, and that you won't overrun on. Okay comfortable with but you won't overrun on you've got to be marked out of a hundred yeah so there's no point in spending an hour and a half on question one an hour on question two 10 minutes on question three and panicking on question four that's a fail so it's really important you just move on it's really important your first question is done to time so you're not on the back foot. And when I say just move on, when I say you're in a hurry, it's not a question of doing a question in an hour. If you've got a 30 mark question, you say that's about an hour. No, you're moving on after nine minutes. Because if the first requirement is for five marks, you've got to sprint for five marks. Yeah, as Ben would say, you've got to be a shark. You've got to keep moving the whole time. It's not a sprint at the end. It's a sprint all the way through and you keep moving. Yeah. One, two, three, four. You choose the order you do the questions. You have a strategy. OK, very comfortable for you to do question one first. Very comfortable for you to do question two first. But it's a deliberate decision that you make. All right. That's the point I'm trying to make. When you come to do question one, it's a pre-populated spreadsheet. You should know that by now. And there are no marks available for the final column. Do not spend your time adding up the final column. Waste of time. 
total waste of time. All right. So just leave that. Promise me you'll not bother because there are no marks available for doing so. All right. So get a life. <laughs> yeah. Move on. All right. Break down the requirement. If the requirement's got the word and in it, you've got to you've got to um, understand that's more than one requirement. Yeah, you should be looking at the requirement. If you see any of my YouTube videos, you'll see me analyzing the requirement and trying to make sure that I answer the question. And my general advice is if you've got five, if it's five, um, five marks, then you want nine minutes. If it's five marks, you try and say five things. Now, the week before the exam, I then actually start changing my tune. I say, well, actually, if it's five marks, maybe say four things. Maybe you haven't got time to say five things. So only say four things. Aim for 80%. And actually, if one of your answers is wrong, rubbish, not developed enough, a repetition, then you get three out of five, you get 60%. Yeah. Do you understand the strategy there? You're not trying to replicate the examiner's answer. You're not trying to be perfect. You're not trying to get the question right. You're trying to pass the exam. It's a game. So for a five mark exercise, Try and say four things. Say them well. White space in between. You'll be fine. Try and say the fifth thing. And you might just spend too long on it. Still not. It's harder to get the fifth mark than it is to get the first mark on the next question. You've only got three hours and 15 minutes. You've only got three hours and 15 minutes. You've got to be very, very tight on time. If there's one message coming out of this, it's time management. I teach a lot of students, I mark a lot of their work. I've been a marker, I've been an examiner. And at this stage of the game, yeah, you should know the stuff. You should know enough to pass. And it's, it's the funnel. It's the funnel that you need to get bigger. It's the funnel. It's your ability to get it down. It's your confidence and experience in answering the question. SBR, it's nothing like skills. There are original questions every time. It's such a big syllabus that the examining team are on drugs. They have an ability to, to, to test your principles. Don't go into the exam with a preconceived answer. It's, it's not going to work. Right. You will be asked to give advice. It will be unique scenarios. Done is better than perfect. I marked a script last week where somebody got 28 out of 30 for question one. They failed the they failed the mock. Well, they didn't fail the mock. Well, they got less than 50. And it was a painful lesson for them to learn because clearly they were a very bright, hardworking student, but they just got carried away and screwed up on the time management. Doing mocks is a safe place to make mistakes. All right. I've been marking a lot. End of now for me. Yeah. Not until. Not for this sitting anyway. Not for this sitting. What's this about? What's this? What's this slide about? What, what what piece of patronizing basic advice am I giving you here? Are you familiar with this acronym? Yeah. Kiss. Kiss. <laughs> Keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. Do not try and say anything weird, wonderful, wacky. Just keep it simple. Short sentences. Yeah. State the obvious. Build the case. Come to a conclusion. Move on. All right. You don't want the prize. 
the risk of going for the prize is you you end up not completing the exam. You want a pass. You can get a good pass. You just want a pass. Everybody will settle for a pass. Yeah? And keep going. Keep going. The road ahead is long. You may not. The road ahead is long. Yeah? But you keep going. You have to keep going. You be like that shark. You manage your time. And you write something for every part to every question. Even if you don't know anything about the topic, stop. Think. Reread the requirement. What is it asking you to do? Do you recognize any keywords? Write something. There's no negative marking. You must write something. Breadth is much more important than depth. If you're sitting at there tonight and you're thinking you know nothing about segmental reporting or you know nothing about related parties, you've got to go and spend a few minutes, not long. You've got to have a look at, you've got to get a bit of information there. You've got to be able to write something about everything. You know, in one of the last exams, there was a whole lot of stuff on, on government grants. You know, five marks on government grants, which, you know, to me seemed to be fairly easy, but because it's a little niche standard, some people have missed out. You only need 50 marks to pass. You only need 50 marks to pass. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not like at work, is it? If you if you if you hand in a piece of work and half of it's crap, half of it's wrong, you haven't done half of the calc, you you'll be fired. But if you hand in a piece of work and half of it's wrong and half of it's right and it's SBR, they say, well done, you've passed. So acknowledge the fact that it's a game. I know some of us have got OCD and we like to have it right and we like to understand everything and we like to have the detail and that makes us good at our jobs. But actually, sometimes the artists among us, the casual, flippant, yeah, I just go, oh, I just go, oh, that, oh. actually, sometimes that is almost a better approach. Yeah. You've got to get 50. You don't have to get 100. That's the point I'm trying to make. 50 is what you need to pass to climb the mountain, to be marked out of 100. Right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for this patience that you have with me. Um, I want to take you through some technical stuff. There's a little bit of technical stuff. I just want to kind of uh, make sure that you're comfortable with. But I'm in all of those pictures. I wonder if anybody recognizes any of the other tutors. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? Do you recognize anybody there? Yay, Ben. That's right. In the middle with the ginger beard. Sean. Yeah. Sean Purcell, top right hand corner in the days when he had a bit of hair. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, very good. That's it. OK, fair enough. Yeah, I was just curious to know. <laughs> anyway, whatever. That's just giving me a moment. Giving me a moment. Right. I am a little bit of a hypocrite in that I say you can't take in a pre-prepared answer, but there are a couple of areas where I really want to make sure you've nailed it down so that if it comes up, you smash it out the park. One of these topics is group accounts. Now, groups comes up in question one. Could be a balance sheet, could be a PL, could be a cash flow. I don't know. And in the topic, there could be foreign currency, there could be step acquisition, there could be impairment, there could be associates, there could be disposals. Don't know. Or there could be control to control. If you own 80% and then you buy 20%, you have a sub and it's still a sub 
what you're doing is you're buying out the NCI. You're paying money to make the NCI disappear. But if you own 80% and you sell 20%, you've still got control again. So both of these are control to control scenarios. In the second scenario, the NCI is going up because you're, you're selling a slice of the business to the non-controlling interest. So in this scenario, the NCI is moving. Goodwill is not. Goodwill will remain the same. Goodwill arises at acquisition, is subject to an impairment review, is potentially retranslated or is retranslated if it's an overseas sub, and then is removed on disposal, derecognized on disposal. Control to control does not impact on the goodwill number as such. Now, it's really important to understand that the transaction is taking place between the parent and the NCI. We're either buying them out or selling to them. And therefore, it's a transaction that is within the group. So under the single entity concept, you can't make a profit from trading with yourself. The group is prepared as if the entities within it are not separate legal entities, but are one. So it's really important always to tell the marker, tell the examiner that in the group accounts, there can be no profit or loss arising from this transaction because it's between the parent and the NCI. It's within group equity. But although there will be no profit or loss arising, there will be a difference. And that difference goes directly to equity. It's not a profit. It's not a loss. It's a difference. And it goes directly to equity and will either make other components of equity go up or other components of equity go down. I hope this is revision. I hope I haven't said anything new. I hope I haven't scared you. I hope you could be writing this out for two or three marks, explaining it to somebody else. Please read these numbers. You do not need a calculator. Once upon a time, you have a 100% owned sub. The assets in the sub are 100 and all the goodwill's already been written off. Now you're selling 10% of the equity for 12. So NCI is going up. We're creating a non-controlling interest. And I have three questions for you. There can be no profit or loss arising, but in this situation, how much is the difference? You've got 12 in, you've sold 10% of the business, you've got 12 in, and Wilma says it's two, and Lash says, says it's two, and Pragyan says it's two, and Kerry Ann says it's two, and Oliver says it's two, Mohammed says it's two, and everybody says it's two, and two is correct. Yeah, two is correct because you are getting 12 in and you're 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 losing 10 percent of 100. You're losing 10. So the difference between the cash in of 12 and the increase in the NCI of 10 is two. That is the difference. Is that difference? Happy or sad? Is that difference in other components of equity? Is that difference of two? Positive or negative? Oh, some say positive, some say negative. Cash is coming in, isn't it? Cash is coming in. Yeah, cash is coming in. And lots of cash is coming in and a small amount is going out. That's positive. That makes me happy. Makes me happy. Yeah, I'd rather have 12 than 8. Yeah, I've got yeah, difference. If, if, if I had coming in of eight, I'd still have a difference of two, but I'd be a bit sad. I'd much rather have 12 coming in. 
So the difference here is positive. Difference here is positive. Yeah. And what's the balance on the NCI? Because there wasn't an NCI before, and now there is an NCI. So how much do we now have on the group balance sheet for NCI? Yeah, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm trying to build your confidence. I'm trying to get you to understand application. So absolutely. All right. Now, if you, you're, you're able to answer that question with no journals. You're not inter I'm not interested in journals, but obviously underneath there is a journal. Money comes in, debit cash. Yeah. And that means if it's a balance sheet, if it's a balance sheet, 12 is going up on your current assets plus 12. If the transaction hasn't been recorded at all, it's plus 12 on current assets. Yeah? If the transaction hasn't been recorded at all, then NCI is a new line and is positive 10. And other components of equity is a positive 2. Yeah? Now, if they've done something different and wrong, you've got to unpick it. But it's easier to explain. It's easier to teach if I say... It's all fresh. It's all new. And what's coming in is, yeah. So that's what's going on if it's a balance sheet. If it's a P&L, if it's a P&L, there should be no numbers anywhere. No numbers in the P&L, no numbers in other comprehensive income either. It just shouldn't be there. So if something was there, you'd just be unpicking it. If it was a cash flow, 12 would be coming in. If it was a cash flow, there'd be a positive figure of 12 because that's the cash that you've got coming in. Yeah. And it's coming in because you've made a transaction with equity. You've made a transaction with the non-controlling interest. 12 has come in because of a transaction with the NCI. Would you think that was day-to-day -day operating? Would you think that was to do with PPE and non-current assets, therefore investing? Or would you think it's to do with debt and equity and therefore financing? Because in a cash flow, you've only got three places to put a cash flow, operating, investing, and financing. Where does the 12 go? Operating, investing, or financing? Are you buying PPE? Are you transacting with PPE? No. This has got nothing to do with investing, nothing to do with investing. Investing is to do with non-current assets, buying them, selling them, nor is it a day-to-day -day transaction, Oliver. So it's not operating. Wilmer is correct. The cash flow is to do with NCI. The cash flow is to do with NCI. You're receiving money from the NCI. When you pay money to the NCI, you... You, that's a financing. Dividends paid to the NCI is financing. So, ah, yeah, I mean, I think it's to that extent in this context, cash flow is the tricky one. I think you know the questions I'm going to ask now. And maybe there's TMI. Maybe there's TMI. Too much information. You're paying out $12. You're paying out to buy 10% of the NCI. You go from an 80% sub to a 90% sub. You're buying out the NCI and you are paying 12. How much is the difference? It's all gone quiet. Who wants to be a millionaire? I'm asking the audience. Rag your hands quick. Yeah. Ooh, we got two different answers. Some say three, some say four. Some say 3.75. <laughs> um, not sure where you get 3.75 from. Popular answer. The mode is three. The mode is three. Michelle is coming up with three. 
Darina is coming up with three. Three is the right answer. Three is the right answer. You're buying out the NCI. All right. So I don't care what the net assets are, to be honest. It's the NCI balance that is the crucial piece of information. If we were buying all of the NCI, the whole of that 30 would disappear. But I'm buying 10% of the 20%. I'm buying half of the NCI. I'm buying half of the NCI. I'm buying 10% and the NCI is 20%. Why is the NCI 20%? Because it's an 80% sub. So I'm halving the NCI balance. The NCI balance is going down by 15 and it's costing me 12. It's costing me 12 to get rid of an NCI of 15. And therefore the difference is three. The difference is three. The difference is three, positive or negative. In the exam, it's, it's good to make a quick decision. If it's wrong, you move on. You don't know whether it's right or whether it's wrong. It's good to make a quick decision. Yeah? I mean, it's 50-50. If, if your mind's blank, it's 50-50. If you've got no idea what's going on, it's 50-50, isn't it? Yeah? So you may as well toss the coin and move on. I'm pausing here because I want some more people to guess. Hopefully you're not driving. Adil, what do you think? Katrina, what do you think? Joel, we did this last night. What do you think? Rishon, you're bright. You like group accounts, Rishon. Yeah? Yeah, it's positive. It's positive. You're only paying out 12. You're only paying out 12. Yeah? And you're getting rid of 15. And so the fact you're paying out less makes you feel happy. So it's definitely positive. And the NCI, the NCI balance, yeah, was 30. You're getting rid of half of it. So it will be 15. It's 30 minus 15. And those of you who like journal entries and double entries, you've got 12 going down in cash. You're paying out money. The NCI is going down and other components of equity is going up by three. You'll never be asked for journal entries. You might be asked for accounting adjustments and you can use journal entries, but you won't specifically be asked for journal entries. You've got to be able to do the plus minus on a balance sheet, minus 12 on the cash. So the top half of the balance sheet comes down by 12, minus uh, 15 on the uh, NCI, and therefore you've got plus three on OCE. So therefore the top half and the bottom half of the balance sheet remains in equilibrium because of the adjustment. I am pausing for a moment. Any observations, questions, issues around what I've just said? Group accounts will be there, question one. Big topic, loads of different issues. Question two is a smaller topic, really. Um, and will involve ethics. Now, ethics can't be examined in a vacuum. It's not a theoretical topic. It's a practical topic. It's an applied topic. So although you learn OPIC, although you learn your objectivity, professional competence, yeah, professional behavior, integrity, confidentiality. So although you learn your five pillars, it's really important in the exam that you link you link the principle to the case. Now, the case could be about accounting. Somebody's done a set of accounts incorrectly, or it could be behavior. It could be about poor internal controls on a computer. It could be about your boss being drunk. You know, what do you do if your boss is drunk the whole time? What do you do if your boss is 
you know, making advances at you or is bullying you? What do you do? That's an ethical dilemma. They they hold power over you. Anyway, so two different sorts of questions. Sometimes it is about a pure accounting scenario. Other times it seems to be more a work environment scenario. And I want to give you some examples of what I think are good sentences that answer. I know we're not seeing the question and I know we're not um, seeing the scenario. Uh, but I think these are earning marks and also getting the professional mark across as well. If a mistake is made. If an accounting error is made. Call it out. Ethical behavior requires accountants to be professional competence. Yeah, due care and attention, up to date. So if we are providing for repair costs, that's wrong. Shows a lack of competence. It's unethical. And we've said that clearly in that sentence. We're linking errors to competence. So definite. We're linking nepotism to objectivity if somebody's having an affair if somebody's a close family member if somebody's a long-standing friend these are giving you clues that there's a lack of objectivity involved yeah when you're dealing when the when the boss is dealing with that person there's a conflict of interest the lack of independence independence is compromised so to promote a close family member without following due process shows a lack of objectivity. Make one mistake, we're all human. Make two mistakes, three mistakes, four mistakes, and you've got a pattern. And if you've got a pattern of mistakes, first of all, you call it out as competence. But then you need to be smart and wise enough to reflect whether or not the mistakes are deliberate. Has there been a reference to profit related pay? Has there been a reference to uh, equity settled share based payments? Has there been a reference to a bonus being paid out if targets are met? Because if there has, yeah, then you've got to throw mud and link it to dishonesty, lack of integrity. All right, deliberate manipulation, creative accounting, all sorts of words you can use. But a pattern of errors is an attempt to mislead and it's contrary to the principle of integrity. And you can question their motives if they've got a lack of independence and objectivity because they're due to get yeah, management bias. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, management bias. Prepare the accounts. Don't question me. Don't don't, you know, follow this treatment. And if you don't, I'll sack you. If you don't, I'll uh, I'll I'll extend your probation. If you don't, I'll give you a bad pay review and you'll have a bonus withheld or follow these instructions to the letter. And if you do exactly what I say, there's a bonus for you. There's a promotion for you. You must simply do what I say and put your professional integrity to one side. That's just wrong. That's bribery. That's bullying. That's unprofessional behavior by the superior who is doing it. And it, first of all, it has to be recognized as such. So bribery and bullying offering pay rises or with off or or suggesting pay rises are withheld is just wrong call it out and confidentiality is not just you gossiping it's you leaving your computer on with your password or sharing your password your failure to observe protocols over passwords Failure to implement new virus control systems. Failure to train your staff, your new staff, around appropriate procedures. 
ignoring appropriate procedures so you set a bad example for others. This is all lacking. This is all it's unprofessional behavior. It shows a lack of ethics. It, it's a breach of confidentiality. Businesses will suffer millions of da losses in damages if if hackers can break into the system and start gaining access to your database and you know the records of your customers' bank accounts. It's a nightmare. All right. It's a nightmare. So these are very important things. Often in exams, you're asked what what should be done? What's the action that should be taken? Now, you've got to be really, really careful here. Because you've got to contextualize what you're saying. But fundamentally, there's not a lot to say if somebody's in an ethical dilemma i think the first thing they should do is talk it out is to say look I, I i don't really understand what's going on this is what i think and document that discussion yeah raise raise the well actually i i think the accounting treatment you're suggesting here might be contrary to the accounting standard can we have a chat about it or I don't like the way you're talking to me. You're always swearing. You're always drunk. I don't like that behavior. So the first thing I think is always is, 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 a, is a discussion. The second thing to do is to think about going down the whistleblower route, finding somebody that you can uh, confide in. Yeah, whether that's the company lawyer, whether that's the company auditor, whether there's a procedure. And... The final, final, final step is to think about resignation, which is really tough. And you've got to have things in proportion. So don't jump in with that straight away. Um, in terms of an action point, um, and maybe an action point is retraining. If, if you're actually talking about the person who is unethical and it's because they've got, they lack competence, and they haven't done their CPD. Yeah, maybe there is maybe there is an issue there, um, and maybe we can get advice from ACCA uh, as well as the the lawyer. Um, but yeah, referring referring them to the code of ethics. Yeah, why not? But you, you've got to contextualize it. Um, so yeah, to to articulate and explain to the bully, or explain to the creative accountant that actually the correct accounting treatment is, yeah, and, and that's with reference to the uh, ethical conduct. Right, please sit back and relax for a minute. This was a question that was set in September. Uh, for three marks, you first of all have to calculate goodwill. Um, and then for five marks, you had to explain how they should assess whether goodwill is impaired. And for these five marks, calculations were not required. Now, what I'm doing here is showing you an answer. And the first part of the answer talks about impairment reviews when the assets are damaged. The second part of the answer talks about revaluations. The third part of the answer talks about deferred tax. And the fourth part of the answer is linking it to cash flow. So just have a read of the answer, please. And let, whilst you're reading it, I quite like it because as a marker, I'm challenged four times. Yes, five marks at stake, right? They haven't gone for the fifth mark. They've gone for four marks. Get four out of five. That's okay. It's 80%. 
and they've clearly delineated. So I like it because it's white space. I like it because the answers are fairly short and they're trying to earn a mark. How many marks would you give it? Five, four, three, two, one. Oliver would give it four. Serena would give it one. Lydia would give it one. Ronit would give it one. Wilma would give it one. XI will give it two. Narain will give it one. Oh, Adama, you're harsh. Zero. <laughs> oh, Michelle, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. What was the question asking? I mean, there's, there's the word auto and goodwill and trailer sorry the word auto and trailer doesn't appear in the answer and actually that makes it more of a memory dump approach than actually how should auto assess so for me i think the answer here is zero or maybe one if i was feeling generous i might give it one but it, it's either zero or one yeah um Technically, everything that's been said is correct. But you don't do an impairment review on goodwill when it's damaged. You do an annual impairment review. You don't revalue goodwill. So the idea of discussing the revaluation story is absolutely irrelevant. Goodwill is not subject to impairment reviews. Sorry, goodwill is not subject to anything to do with deferred tax. It's scooped out of deferred tax, small technical point. So what they say about deferred tax is okay. It's just, it's, it's just however, totally irrelevant to goodwill <laughs> and not relevant to auto. Impairment losses, non-cash. Yeah, it's true, but... That's where, if I was feeling generous, I would give a mark. Yeah. Oranges are not the only fruit. Apples. Apples are my favorite fruit. Because what you need to do in a question, what you need to do in an answer, is application, application, application. So you need to write something along the following lines. Goodwill is automatically assessed on an annual basis for impairment, full stop. Or the goodwill of trailer will be automatically annually assessed by auto for goodwill. If you can write a sentence which uses the word annual goodwill annual impairment review auto trailer mix those words up in a sentence bang you got yourself a mark and that is always charged against profit and assessing whether goodwill is impaired involves you thinking about the recoverable amount yeah an asset is impaired when the carrying value exceeds the recoverable amount. Now, the trouble with goodwill is how do you, you can't sell it. You can't recover money from selling goodwill. And goodwill on its own doesn't generate a future cash flow. So there's no present value of future cash flows. So the recoverable amount of goodwill on its own is nil. So what three letter acronym? Are you going to get a mark for discussing what three letter acronym is relevant when you're talking about impairment loss of goodwill? Thank you very much, Carrie Ann. Thank you very much, everybody. CGU, cash generating unit, a collection of assets 
that together generates an independent stream. Yeah, trailer. The goodwill of trailer will be assessed at the level of a cash generating unit. The impairment loss will be, first of all, allocated against the goodwill. And then if you're feeling bold, and it sort of was more relevant when you when you had the background of the question, because the background of the question had NCI measured as a proportion of net assets. And if you've got NCI measured as a proportion of net assets, the consequences of that is, is convoluted because the consequences of that is that you're only charging that against the parent. There's no charge to the NCI. And within the goodwill, there's a grossing up. Within the impairment review process, there's a grossing up. I think some students did really badly on that question. And it wasn't because they didn't know. It was because they didn't apply. They didn't think. They didn't have the craft. They didn't have the training. One mark per valid point. Answer the question. Apply your knowledge. Yeah, well done. Well done. Yeah, make reference to auto, make reference to trailer within the answer. Right, what's coming up in the exam? Um, that's the wrong question. It's what's coming up in the exams. I've been teaching this for a long time. I've spent my professional life, my professional career, teaching students to pass SBR, P2, FRE, AFA. It's had various different incarnations. When it was twice a year and there was new accounting standards coming out to a year, it was pretty obvious what was coming up because in the old days, they would have a 25 mark question and that 25 mark question was a current issue in the old days. So I'd be pretty good at tipping. Now, there are two, three different exams. Some of you are sitting it in the morning. Some of you are sitting it in the afternoon. Some of you are sitting it in Gambia. Some of you are sitting it in Yorkshire. Some of you are sitting it in Jamaica, some of you are sitting in India, wherever. There's more than one exam. So I could tip, I could say, look, I, I, I've had a dream. Question one's going to be this, question two's going to be that, question three's going to be that, question four's going to be that. And maybe I'll be right for half of you, but I'll be totally wrong for the other half. This just depends whether you get exam A or exam B or exam C. The whole syllabus, in other words. The whole syllabus is coming up. Yeah. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. If you've never done a cash flow question one, do one this weekend. If you've never done a PL, do one this weekend. If you've never done a balance sheet, do one this weekend. Because you've got to be prepared for whatever is thrown at you. You've got to know something about every standard. You've got to know something about every standard. Everything's coming up. Sorry about that. If you dialed in, hoping for me to say something very specific. I mean, I can say something very specific. Question one will be on groups. Question two will be on ethics. Question three and four will be on accounting standards. And there'll be an investor focus in it. It's mainly a narrative exam. The conceptual framework is an important issue and the conceptual framework is often used by students and in answers when it's a current issue and there isn't an accounting standard to solve it so if you were talking about bitcoin or you were talking about um a topic for which there for which you were not sure you could say well what's the useful thing to do in this situation you know, what's the relevant thing to do? Yeah. What, you know, is this an asset? Is this a liability? So the conceptual framework is useful in that regard. This man here is, he is a man. He is a real man. He is um, Viv Richards, who was a cricketer. 
is a cricketer, was a cricketer. I saw him play. And he had a he had a phrase which said, uh, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Now, I'm going to wish you luck. I'm going to wish you luck at the end of this. But actually, it's a slight lip service. Because according to Viv Richards, really, there isn't anything such as luck. You make your own luck by working hard. All right. By working hard. Yeah. And thinking about how you can gain those professional marks. In the ethics, the professional marks are clearly linked to um, making sure that your answer and the principles are connected and showing something that is coherent and showing action points, even if they're not asked for. With ethics, you show action points, even if they're not asked for. The professional marks in question four tend to be awarded if the answer is complete. If the answer is rounded, if the answer is considered. OK, so the rich get richer. And the poor get poorer. If you have a badly constructed question, which is incomplete, it's not going to earn you professional marks. The idea of professional marks is this could be handed to a client. This could be handed to your boss. It looks. It, it has a beginning, middle and end. All right. So make your own luck, says Viv Richards. Cut out the negative. You don't have perfect knowledge. You don't need perfect knowledge to pass this exam. You need to get quicker. You need to stop being negative. All right, cut. Close Gollum down. Some of you know what I mean. Yeah, get rid of those negative thoughts. Be you. Answer the question. Write it down. Get it off your chest. If in doubt, guess. Yeah? You've worked hard. Keep going to the very end. Keep going to the very end. If you're going to pass with 50, 52, you'll be earning that mark. Not in the first hour, not in the second hour, not even in the third hour. You'll be earning that mark as they're about to close the computer down after three hours and 14 minutes. But you don't sprint at the end you sprint all the way through because you move on after five marks you move on after five marks you move on after five marks you keep the scoreboard ticking over have i said time management is important i think i have am i going to wish you luck of course i am but i'm slightly insincere because you've got to make your own luck Oh, I've been going for an hour. How exciting. And I've answered some of your questions, but let's just have a couple of minutes, see if there are any other further questions here. Um, any tips on how to recall things? Yeah, write them down on post-it notes, put them in front of your toilet, put them in front of your kettle and uh, look at them several times a day, talk them out. Yeah, if you've got silly little things that you need to learn, um, repetition is always good. Uh, what are my views on the December mock? Well, I wrote the December mock, the, the pre-December mock. I wrote it. Um, my views are that you should have done it. Um, did you do the pre-December mock? Yeah, laudanum. Did you do that? Question one, balance sheet with the impairment of financial assets. Did you have, uh, if you've done it, Put a why. If you've done the pre-December mock, tell me that you've done it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you've watched the debrief videos. You've seen the model answer. Yeah, the model answers are there as you go through. 
Very good. Beneficial experience, I hope. If you haven't done it, then I know what you're going to be doing this weekend. If you haven't done the pre-ACCA, pre-December mock, then you'll be doing it this weekend. So either you've done it or you are going to do it. And um, yeah. Um, if you come, so, so the scripts, so the answers, so the marks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. At skills, it's a computer that marks all the multiple choice questions, of course. At strategic, at, at the strategic level, markers are involved at every step of the way because there's no, very often, there's no right or wrong answer. Obviously, if there's a calculation, the number can be can be right, but you can still get marks if it's wrong, if you've done the right method and showed an audit trail. So, you know, when, you, when you're discussing issues, you know, sustainability reporting, you know, why should there be sustainability reporting? Uh, what are the advantages of sustainability reporting? Why do invest? There's two, three, four, five, six different things that can be said, but there may only be three or four marks available. So answers are always going to be different from the model answer. Trust me, not one single student ever produces an answer, anything like the examiner's answer. I mean, the examiner's answer is written... It, you know, it takes hours to write the examiner's answer and it's a bit of an academic and it, it goes on a bit and it's not capable, really. It's not a, it's not an example. I mean, I, you know, I like to play a bit of football. I like to play a bit of rugby, but I'm not I'm not Owen Farrell and I'm not Lionel Messi. Um, but you can kind of look at them and try and learn from them. But it's not actually what you're capable of doing. And it's not you shouldn't beat yourself up if the answer that you've done is not has ha, doesn't have the same length and doesn't have the same subtlety about it. Um, one of the things I do with my students is mark their work. I mark their work. So I'm able to give them confidence on specifics on the work that they've handed in. I can say whether it's worth a mark or not, and we can have a practical discussion um, around that. But uh, uh, that's, 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 that's for another time. Good. I think you know what I'm going to say. Um, the idea that the I so 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 the idea of topics. Uh, I have no idea what's coming up in exam one, exam two, or exam three. I sat down and wrote that mock exam, and just tried to put in lots of different things in it. Yeah, I don't know what's coming up in the exam and nor do any of the A's, a very, very few people. This is a very small handful of people in, in the world who knows what's coming up in the exam. And they're the examining team. No one else in ACCA knows. They operate very strict protocols, as you can imagine. And as I have explained, it's a wide syllabus. As I have explained, there's two or three different versions of the exam. And therefore, I am not tipping topics i will say the group accounts is coming up uh i will say ethics is coming up uh i will say ifrs is coming up uh yeah and i will say that you know the more you practice the luckier you get but yeah obviously i would love it if 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 the topics that i wrote and put in that mock exam came up in the real exam but to be honest it would be luck but the process of doing it builds up your confidence. The process of doing it, it's like playing a practice match. When you play a practice match, you know, and then when you play a real game, that the, the 11 footballers you're playing against are slightly different shapes and sizes and the ball is kicked around the pitch in a slightly different way. But the fact that you've done a practice match means that you're better, means that you're better. Mohammed, what do you think the answer to your question is? What do you think the answer to your question is? Because I know the answer to that question. Well, I'll know it in eight days' time. I'll know I'll know the answer in eight days' time. Right. 
Thank you very, very much. Look, I wish you all the best. Have a listen to my podcast. It's free. It's on Spotify. It's on Google. It's on Apple. Have a listen to my podcast. Have an access to my YouTube channel. Resources are out there. Follow me on LinkedIn, although I guess that's how you found me because you've been here already. And look, take it easy. Keep the faith. Keep going. Do questions to time. Do questions to time. And thank you, Rishon. Thank you for staying up. Thank you for dialing in. Rima, excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Good questions. Adama, thank you very much indeed. Excellent. All right. Time to go. Time to go.